Well, tonight the Lord gives me a passage to begin with over in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. It's not our purpose to lose you in all the various divisions of faith as we study false faith, but uh, some demarcation is necessary so that we can find out just what is faith and what isn't faith. After all, since we're told over in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, in essence, faith is the most important thing, That's right. then not only is it important, you might not have thought of it in this way, not only is it important for us to know what faith is, but we have to know what faith isn't. That's right, buddy. And not only can we know who is teaching faith, but we should also at the same time know who is not teaching faith, although they use the English word F-A-I-T-H. Why? Because it's not enough to know what is right and who is right if you don't at the same time know what's wrong and who's wrong. A lot of people would be saved a lot of unnecessary confusion in their life if they would, from the very beginning of their charismatic experience, have known who was wrong and what was wrong. You wouldn't have even had to have known what was right and who was right. I mean, obviously, really one comes with the other when you get right down to it and really study it out, and one comes with the other. But a lot of people would have been saved, a lot of unnecessary wandering around charismatic circles, going around and around in circles, wondering about things in their life and never really seeing God do anything for them. Amen. If they would have known what was wrong about what people were saying when they used the English word faith, and who was wrong? Because the Bible shows us, as well as experience, that more are going to be wrong than right. And so you ought to look for those that are wrong, and then it'll be easy to find the ones that are right. <laughs> if you look for the one that's right, you'll probably never find them. <laughs> it's like a needle in a haystack, trying to find someone that's right. But just keep your eyes open, and you'll find out right away who's wrong. They use the same Bible that we do. I mean, your heart just goes out to these people, these flocks, I mean, these multiplied tens of thousands of people that show up in these uh, circus on wheels in auditoriums where you've got people teaching about faith and healing and so forth. You've got thousands of people. They use the same Bible that we do, same passages. They speak the same English language. They use the same words, faith. They talk about healing. They talk about the promises of God. They talk about positive confession. They talk about deliverance and salvation. But you just have to wonder, are we really speaking the same language? Or is there a language of faith and then a language of pseudo-faith, which is what we're looking at tonight, the counterfeit faith movement. We could easily teach last week's message all over again on the balanced faithers because they're the ones in the majority out there. They take care of all unbelievers. They take care of all of non-charismatic denominational people as well as charismatic denominational people. Perhaps the ministry headquartered in Baton Rouge is the largest one, Louisiana, of the balanced faithers always writing articles and books and preaching live messages and preaching on tape and over the airwaves, whether television or radio, criticizing these that we would call counterfeit, that he would call those that are in this uh, false form of Gnosticism, uh, that are teaching that you can actually have what you say, that you can claim the promises, and even though you don't see any change for the better, perhaps sometimes even observe a little change for the worse, that you still can stand on the promises of God and receive what God has promised. Now, this particular ministry, as well as a lot of others that will get underneath this ministry's wings, are continuing to come out against those that are teaching faith. Some of the articles that we read, obviously, were from that ministry. But we're not going to go back and teach last week's messages, although I've got the notes right here. I could easily just... <laughs> turn the page and go back to last week, we could all stand hearing that again Amen. because people are wanting to balance things. Amen. But we'll go on beyond that tonight. We'll go on to that second category that we gave. That's why I said we don't want to lose you in all the categories. Really, there are only three. 
But you have to make the distinctions because we're all using the same word faith. Even these people who are balanced faithers say, oh, we believe in faith. Faith is important. Well, what do they mean by faith? Do they just mean faith for getting the soul saved? And is that all they mean? Well, practically speaking, that's all they mean. Faith to get the soul saved. Uh, Romans 1.17, justification by faith. And when you've said that, you've said it all. And if you go beyond that, like for these things that you really can touch out and feel and it's something tangible in the now, Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is, then they get a little hazy in that area. And so we have to make a distinction between those and the second group that we can call, it's a name that I've been given from the Lord. I could never think of a good name for them because they are part of the faith movement, but we'll call them the counterfeit faith people, the counterfeit faith movement, because it is, they are talking about faith, the subject is faith, but it's a counterfeit. You see, we're not going to call it something that it isn't. I mean, a dollar bill that's a counterfeit is still a dollar bill, but it's a counterfeit, but it's still a one dollar bill. But it will not do what a true government-printed, treasury-issued $1 bill will do. It won't do that unless you've got someone who's unknowledgeable in the area of currency and how to detect the true and false. And guess what? You can pass that counterfeit off on them. And guess what? Most people aren't experts in the word. That's right. Most people aren't experts. And so what happens? You can just pass off that counterfeit $1 faith bill to just multitudes of people. And because they've never been trained in the Word of God, because they've never been trained faith, all they know about faith is what they're being taught right now. I mean, they never heard of faith in their denomination. So all they know about faith is counterfeit faith. That's why they will fight you so tenaciously whenever you come across with the true biblical message of total faith and the promises of God. Because what you're saying is not what they learned in their denomination. And moreover, what you're saying is not what they learned when they first began to learn about faith. 99% of the time, it's not what they first heard. It was one of these try God things. And make sure you've got a back door in case things don't work. When the Bible says, Jeremiah 17, 5, that a curse is going to be on the one that trusts in man and leans to the arm of the flesh. And they'll tell us right out of one side of the mouth, trust in the Lord, and out of the other side, trust in man. Amen. But you see, if you're not knowledgeable in the Word, you don't ever pick these things up. You know, it's only the person who's been trained to recognize not what's right, but what's wrong. Or in some cases, not what's wrong, but what's right. It all boils down to the same final end result that they finally can tell, now, is this of God or is this not of God? Now, here in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, notice what Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course, be glorified even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Well, we can say an amen to that. <laughs> all men don't have faith. They've got the English word. They've got the letters to put it together. But they really can't, biblically speaking, spell biblical faith. Faith is still one of these abstractions. It's still not a reality in their life. You'll hear them talking about if you don't believe what you're confessing, just keep on confessing it anyway. And the Bible never teaches that. Uh, that's showing right away that you don't know what faith is because faith isn't just saying that you've got something when really you don't even believe what you're saying. Faith is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance. Faith is the substance. Faith Amen. says you've already got it. Amen. So how could you not believe what you're saying when you've already got what you're saying unless you don't understand what faith is? And I mean, just what I've said so far in what, 10 minutes <laughs> would confuse your average charismatic to no end. He'd be tapping you on the shoulder saying, where is that brother coming from? <laughs> or they'd be saying, <laughs> or they'd be asking, where is he going? Because they would not be able to follow along. They would already been lost in the maze of Bible verses and, you know, what is faith and what isn't faith. 
You know, over the last few years, more things have been written about faith, articles and books on, you know, what, what is faith? Someone says, what is faith? And then here comes someone's definition of what faith is. Well, faith is loving God. Well, that's not what faith is. That's what love is, loving God. And they'll start tacking on definitions that don't even go with the word. And forget Hebrews 11 ones in the Bible. And those that remember that Hebrew 11 ones in the Bible, they don't know what that verse means. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Oh, come on, Paul, give us a little better explanation than that. <laughs> substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. No, I really, I want to know what faith is. Well, that's what he's telling us. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they want something they can really touch and hold on to to be able to understand it. And never give the Holy Spirit time to show them what the Word of God means and what the Word of God is saying there. Because it is so plain. And besides the definition, we have so many examples in Hebrews 11 of what faith is and of what faith will do for you. It did for Sarah the impossible. Bore a child when she's 90 years old. And we're told there, that wasn't just, people read the stories in the Old Testament and think it just happened to them somehow. But when you get to Hebrews 11, it says that that happened to her because of her and Abraham's faith. Amen. It didn't just happen to her. Something caused it to happen. And it was their faith that caused it to happen. And not only did she bear a child when she was 90, she had been barren for all of those 90 years. And so you've got really a twofold miracle there. A barren woman giving a child, but then a barren woman past the childbearing age bearing a child. Now, if that's not impossible, I don't know what impossible is. A barren woman giving birth to a child past the childbearing age. Now, that's a miracle. All those things don't happen. All they do happen. Right here in the church, as a matter of fact. I remember uh, one sister here in the church. I never knew what it was. She was always toting into the church. But uh, this is back when we were meeting at the other place. And she was always carrying in her baby. Yet there wasn't a baby in whatever it was she was carrying. And uh, if I remember correctly, she'd always go lay it down where everything else was laid down as though there were a baby in it. Now, what do you think they'd do with you? <laughs> Well, you know the rest of that question. If you carried in a little whatever you call the things and you said your baby's wrapped up in there and you want to go, you know, relieve yourself of the child and they look in there, there's nothing in there. Well, what do you think they could have said of Sarah and Abraham when they said, we have a child? Well, where? They always want to know where. Can you prove it to me? Can you show it to me? Eventually you'll be able to, but maybe right now you can't. Amen. But faith's not a substitute. Faith is the substance of the things that you're hoping for. Amen. Hope is important. If you weren't hoping, you wouldn't be praying. But if you don't have faith, you won't get anything even if you are praying. That's right. Faith or hope comes first, but then faith comes after that. Hope is what makes you pray. You hope that you can get something, so you start praying. But as long as there's no faith there, although you are praying and hoping, you'll get nothing from either one of those two things, neither hoping nor praying. What brings you the result is faith. What gets you going in the first place is your desire to have something. That's all hope is. You desire something. That's what gets you going. But then faith is what brings you the result. So there in Hebrews 11, you've got a whole catalog, 40 verses, a whole catalog of what faith will do when you put the promises of God into effect in your life. One of those things just happened to be the birth of a supernatural child. And God's not out of the birthing business. Uh, he's not out of the healing business. He's not out of the prosperity business. I was reading the other day in uh, a theologian's writings, uh, a studies in dogmatics of a theologian, uh, wrestling, you can tell he's wrestling with the subject of faith and miracles, was well, on the subject of miracles, and he comes right out and says, he says, we have to be honest with ourselves and with the Word of God, reformed theologian, 
and say that we're not given the slightest hint anywhere in the New Testament that God all of a sudden was going to change after the first century and start working through men rather than doing things supernaturally. Now, that's being honest. And he's right. There's never a hint there. You know, the series I read before that, the fellow, every other page was saying, now, the first century was special and the apostles were special and God stopped working miracles and tongues stopped after the first century. But he never gave a verse for that because there aren't any. And so another fellow was honest to say that we're never given one hint that God's going to somehow change. As a matter of fact, he said we're given just the opposite. Over in Hebrews 13, he doesn't change. But we're never given a hint that God is going to change and start working through the instrumentality of man. But you can tell he's wrestling because two pages later he says, however, that doesn't mean we should shun medical science or loan institutions and so forth. You know, you feel for someone. You can tell they're wrestling because he's backed himself up in a corner with the word of God. Now, he did it. I didn't do it to him like I do to you. <laughs> He did that to himself and comes right out and admits there's no hint that God's going to all of a sudden stop being God and abdicate the throne and put medical science on the throne. But yet, if he continues with that, then he knows he's got to stop his medical payments. So he's not even alive anymore. Uh, let's hope he made it into the kingdom. If he had everything else right, I trust that he did. But I'll tell you what, people are getting off today in faith. Guess what? They're falling for JDS heresy and everything else. Yeah. Because the very ones in this counterfeit faith movement are teaching all these other heresies. Right. And so when you believe one, you pretty much have to believe it all. Amen. Because you're saying, well, look, here, the one who's teaching me about faith is teaching me all these other things. And I was wrong about faith before, so I'm probably wrong about everything else. And you can't help but just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. But the Bible says here in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2, all men don't have faith. Now that comes as a surprise to some people. They say, well, we've all got faith. Everyone believes in God. Or if they really have any understanding of faith beyond that, well, we all believe. We all believe. <laughs> You know, this real vague thing. Well, everyone has faith. Every man has faith. Every woman, even boys and girls have faith. Well, Paul says every man doesn't have faith. Paul knew, and we know from experience, Amen. that not everyone does have faith. A lot of people have a counterfeit form of faith. And it's really not doing anything for them. But it is stirring up quite a controversy now out in charismatic circles. Here's an article I cut out several years ago with the title of it, The Controversy Over Faith, from a national charismatic magazine. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith, yet there is such a furrow over the faith message. Why? They start off with the Wesley Parker case back in the late 70s where, well, it got national media headlines and attention where a parent, or two parents, as a matter of fact, had taken their 11-year-old diabetic son off of his insulin medication. He ended up dying on their hands. And so it got national coverage as a result of that. And ever since then, things have just been spreading like, well, like brush fire in the so-called faith movement, faith controversies that have arisen. They go on to say that the controversies become so intense that a group of theology professors at Oral Roberts Universi University recently sent out a paper uh, criticizing and attacking the teachings of another charismatic school, Rhema Bible Training Institute, just eight miles away. Uh, I've been to both of them before. They're just right down the road from each other. And so here's one balanced faith group, and here's one counterfeit faith group, and they're fighting at each other or really the balanced faithers are fighting against the counterfeit faithers. You've got a whole group of professors of theology writing these theological papers against the Bible Training Center right down the road. And of course, the Bible Training Center, they don't know anything about the Bible, so they certainly can't argue against these uh, professors of theology, most of them with PhD degrees, if you will, and not THD degrees, but nevertheless, advanced education in the curriculum of theology. And so you've got one group fighting against another, what? Over the meaning, definition, nature of faith, as the Bible portrays it. 
One of them think faith means this, another one of them think that faith means this. Well, what does faith mean? Well, the Bible tells us what faith is, what faith will do. Amen. That's right. As a matter of fact, the same group of professors were instrumental in having a faith teacher banned from ORU's campus. They go on to trace the origin and quick rise of the faith movement and the faith message by saying that within the last decade you've had so many, well, not hundreds of thousands, millions now of denominational Christians receiving the Acts 2-4 experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, coming out of their denominations, mixing in with the Pentecostal churches, and getting some of the leftover teachings of people like Wigglesworth and F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth, some of the other great early names that uh, were in the outpouring the early part of this century, just gobbling up this Pentecostal-type teaching, but then really adding a new little twist to it, more of a certainty to it, and they call this now the faith message and the faith movement. It says that uh, thousands, of Christians have now adopted the faith message, positive confession, divine healing, and now this is introduced to us a second generation of faith teachers. Some of the major teachers, uh, they say, include Kenneth Hagin. They call him the grandfather of the group. Ken Copeland, the brightest rising new star, Texas evangelist, following on the heels of Hagin. Now, this is right in a charismatic magazine. Fred Price, a black pastor in California. Charles Capps, a farmer in Arkansas. <laughs> Don Gossett, Canadian evangelist. Others, such as Charles and Francis Hunter, Marilyn Hickey of Denver, and a Houston pastor uh, by the name of John Osteen. Now, that's just a quick sampling out of a charismatic magazine. We could go on and list more, but we'll stay safe since we're reading someone else's material and not dreaming up our own names, to leave it with this as a sample of just who out there is teaching something about faith. Now, of course, you have to know something about what everyone's saying to find out whether or not you're to put them under a balanced faith movement or a balanced faith teaching or under what we're looking at here this evening, the counterfeit faith teaching. Now, it's very interesting, I can say this before we move on, it's very interesting that most of the attacks that are coming are coming from the balanced faithers, and it's directed toward the counterfeit faithers. Now, you just think about that for a moment, and you'll see that I'm right. In the first place, we are so few, the total faithers, the overcomers, because the Bible says that we'll be few. Amen. We're so few that we're not nearly as well known as these hundreds of thousands of counterfeit faithers. So we generally aren't, as, aren't attacked and criticized as much, at least on a national scale, as are these uh, counterfeit faithers because there are so many of them. And the balanced faithers don't like being stood up in front of the whole world and portrayed as though they don't even believe in God by the counterfeit faithers who are saying, now, you've got to trust God totally. And the balanced faithers are saying, you know, it's all right to go to the doctor, it's all right to do this, and they don't like that. And so most of the attacks are coming from the balanced faithers, and it's directed toward the counterfeit faithers. Just to give you one example, what we just covered here, the beginning of this article, you've got this group of theology professors at ORU. Now, what do they believe at ORU? They believe in uniting God's two streams of healing power, medical science and prayer. They don't even say faith. You know, prayer never does anything for you. But anyway, that's their theory, that you, are not, you unite the two streams of God's healing power, medical science and prayer. And so they have a new medical hospital built there where you have not only your private doctor and nurse, but your private prayer partner, your prayer counselor. <laughs> They'll come and pray for you whenever the doctors give up on you. You know, whenever there's no hope for you, then they'll come and pray with you. But even the dean of the school there says now, healing comes by natural means. I mean, he comes right out and says it. I've got some things where he's quoted and saying that, that 99% of the cases, or he even says more than that, 
99% of the cases of people getting well here are getting well by natural means. So what he's saying, he's not doing nothing but confessing the fact that prayer doesn't work. So why go to the trouble of have, having all the prayer partners in? When you say that we never get anything done by prayer anyway. But really what they try to portray is that God works through the prayers, through the doctors. You know, it's this long route that you get lost in the woods because of the trees. He works through the prayers, through the doctors, into your body to heal you. So if the doctors ever get you well, then in essence, prayer is what did it. Because after all, doctors can't heal, medicine can't heal, and so it's just by the grace of God. And if you pray, then God will use the already skilled hands of the physician and make them more skilled. So he can cut you half in two and sew you back up and make you look only twice as bad as you used to look maybe 10 years ago. And uh, maybe some people you know have got the scars to prove it. That's right. Uh, whenever you go for these double and triple bypasses and removing kidney stones and fixing that collapsed lung and that other liver over there, uh, you'll look like something that should be on the inside of you rather than on the outside of you. <laughs> something that should be covered up from the view of everyone looking because you can't really tell what it is. You know, you've seen people just all scarred up from all of the knives of surgeons practicing medicine on them. And that's all they do is practice. And you have to get tired of getting, uh, letting people practice on your body. You know, they say that they're going to do the practicing on guinea pigs, but... You can't do a triple bypass on a guinea pig. <laughs> no, you got to have a human, someone to let you practice on them. You can't implant a permanent heart in a human unless it's a human. And so you got to have people like uh, Dr. Clark who will volunteer to be used as a human guinea pig to see how long with this whole room full of machinery they can keep you alive and make you just feel miserable and you don't even know what's going on the whole time you're alive. It'd be better to be dead than to be alive in cases like that. Just soon go on and be with the Lord. That's right. I mean, I wouldn't want to be kept alive till I was 90 years old and I wasn't even conscious of the fact that I was existing. Nothing but a human vegetable. You ought to go ahead and pull the plug or do whatever you have to do to go ahead and be with the Lord if that's what you want to do. If you, I mean, if you're wanting to find out whether you're a believer or not, pull the plug and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Just how quick could you find out? Very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly. Well, getting back on the subject, these counterfeit faith teachers really don't do any better than medical science because, as you'll see as we go along, in essence, they point us back to the same thing that the balanced faithers do. However, I was saying that the balanced faithers are the ones who are always criticizing the counterfeit faithers. Now, if you someone like us, then they really want to criticize us. The counterfeit faithers, to make themselves look good in the eyes of the world, have adopted this little thing they call the love walk so that they look better than everyone else by not criticizing their critics. In other words, the counterfeit faithers are walking what they call the love walk so that they don't criticize the balanced faithers and it makes them look a lot better. But I'll tell you what, whenever, <clears throat> let's leave for a moment the balanced faithers out of the picture, whenever you get together a total faither with a counterfeit faither, then you find out that love walk disappears all of a sudden. That's right. As long as they're around someone that's under them, you know, a balanced faith that believes in still going to the doctor, they'll just continue to love that brother. But you find someone who knows more about the Word of God and whom they know knows more about the Word of God, and love walk just vanishes like a puff of smoke. Amen. I know, because Amen. I got in trouble teaching about faith in a faith school. Can you believe it? In a faith school where they stand for all of this, they've been educated down there in the den of deception. And uh, so here I come teaching on faith in a faith school. And I got in trouble. Why? Because it wasn't this counterfeit faith. It was true Bible faith. It was one that says, live, die, sink, or swim. We're going to trust him. And they didn't want to have to do it that way. And what happened? Out we go. What happened to the love walk? The love walk just vanished. You see, 
<laughs> that love walk is really not true. It's not genuine. It's not what they believe, and it's not what they practice. Because when you get someone who believes a total message around them, they all of a sudden just begin to bristle. Because they don't like being just like they've done to the balanced faith or stood up in front of the eyes of the rest of Christendom and made it look as though they don't even believe in God. That's about the way it appears whenever you come on with a strong message of faith like we always are doing. It makes other people look like they're not even saved. And sometimes, you know, you wonder, well, is anyone else saved besides ourselves? Because the Bible believes, the Bible teaches that we believe what God has said in his word. Amen. Now, it doesn't say that it gives us the right to draw lines, you know, between point A and point B and make this uh, picture out of it that spells salvation, that I'll draw all the lines and cut the Bible up and paste it together, and I'll believe for salvation, but that's about all I'm going to believe for. And I'll believe for it truly with all my heart. Why do you think that's so easy for people to believe for? It's because you can't ever tell whether you really got it or not. But healing, prosperity, salvation of loved ones, you know about things like that. I mean, you can see it. That's why everyone wants to believe in salvation, because you can't really tell whether you've got it or not. Leaving aside for a moment the fact the Bible tells you you can know that you've got eternal life. But you really can't tell. I mean, you can't touch it or handle it or feel it or look at it or see it. And so it's easy to just say, oh, I, I, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, because who would contradict that? But when you say, I'm healed, and you don't look like you're healed, then you're in for a lot of trouble right away. <laughs> but you can do that about salvation and get away with it. You see, that's why. You see, people are smart enough to work ways out so they can look like they're doing something for the Lord when they're really not at all, when they can look like they're further along than they really are, when they really they don't know anything about God or the Bible or about the faith message. Now, as I say, I know from experience because in more than one place we've taught something and gotten in trouble, even though the people there stood for, they would call it, you know, a word church, a faith church, word people, faith people. And yet when you really teach the word and not man's interpretation of the word, when you really teach the word, Psalm 118.8, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. That's the word. And they call themselves word people. And what happens when you teach the word? Out you go. Left foot of fellowship, out you go. Amen. That's right. Why? Because it appears like they don't even believe in God. Your strong faith message and strong faith walk compared to their old watered-down, weak, shallow, compromising message, <laughs> like leftover coffee or something the next morning, that's about what it looks like. Amen. Yeah, I had one of the leaders there. They were in an automobile accident and, you know, bumped their head and had a little scratch on it or something like that. And... <laughs> went to the doctor had the doctor check it out had everyone down there pray for him and finally I didn't know that all this had happened before finally came to me for me to pray for him and so I laid hands and prayed and the anointing was there and jumped back and said wow said something really happens you know whenever you pray and uh, so they ended up kicking me out several months later and there was proof of the fact that something's working for someone around there this was the very person, by the way, who had been claiming that God's divine anointing light would be seen there in their school, you know, to put his check of approval upon it. And guess who it was seen over? The only one there. That's right. More than one person saw it one service, and more than one person came up afterwards and said there was uh, this whole ball of light that was just encircling you uh, like an like a arc that went from one side of you from one side of the pulpit all the way down to the other. And so I told them about that, the people that were claiming it, and they were real excited, but then what happened? Two months later, out we go. <laughs> I mean, the very things that they were wanting, we were giving them. Amen. That's right. They wanted the Word, they were getting the Word. That's right. They wanted faith, they were getting faith. But they, they got more than what they thought that they were wanting. In other words, they were wanting faith, but they had a misconception about faith. They were wanting the Word, but they had a misconception about what the Word was. The Word wasn't just this neat little system of about, oh, 25 or 30 uh, common proof texts, you know, Matthew 21, 22, 3 John 2, you know, just those 25 or 30 proof texts that says that you can have things from God. Well, they found out, well, there's a whole Bible there. 
say we're supposed to learn and practice so that we can not just say that we know the will of God, but that we can do the will of God in our lives. Amen. If you got beyond the 25 or 30 regular proof texts, some for healing, some for praise, some for victory, some for salvation, some for door-to-door -door witnessing, whatever you wanted, a couple of texts for each one of those, if you got beyond that, you got beyond them because they wanted to stay with the Sunday school lesson. All those Bible verses, all that Bible knowledge, you mean we're supposed to actually know all of that stuff? <laughs> It's a lot easier going somewhere where all they require of you is memorizing about 25 or 30 passages. One each for healing and salvation and deliverance and all the other things. And not assimilate throughout your whole life's experience the whole message in the Word of God. Although that's what they're saying that they want, in essence and in fact, and the bottom line is that's really not what they want. Because whenever you offer it to them, and you can offer it on a silver platter, they'll turn the platter upside down and put it on your head and then give you the left foot of fellowship. <laughs> and the whole time saying, no, we're a word group, we're a word church, we're a faith people, we believe in the faith message. And it's not the faith message that's going on there, it's a counterfeit faith message. They really don't believe what the Word of God is saying. And it's been proven more than one time whenever you simply tell them what the Word does say. Especially what it says about faith. I'll give you some examples here in a moment. But you can ask yourself, or if you haven't, or you don't want to, then I'll ask for you. What did you ever really see happen when you were out under the influence of some of these false prophets and false apostles and deceitful workers? You can go ahead and name both of them. That's right, because that's about all you saw is maybe two things happened. What did you ever see happen out there besides confusion in your life? How many prayers did you really ever get answered when they were telling you, now the Word of God says you can have this and this is what can happen in your life? How many times did you really see it happen? I dare say maybe once or twice, and that's probably all you saw. You got nothing out there but a lot of confusion. Now, it's not that you can always prove what's right by the results, but... You can prove something definitely to be wrong if it doesn't have positive results afterward. You see, you can get results from a false message and from a true message. You can get it from both. So just because you got the results doesn't mean that the message is true. But if you don't have results, and that only proves one thing, the message is not true. And dear friends, we get results around here. Amen. Hundreds of them. Uh, the brother that gave the testimony tonight, what's he going to get out of that, $100,000? No doubt if he would have stayed under the influence of some of these other people, they would have just put him more into bondage Amen. rather than getting him out, Amen. telling people what they can have, and he had plenty. He just had to get out of what he had so that he could get what he had. Amen. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, you know, people say this faith message brings you into bondage. No, it liberates you from bondage. Because Romans 13, 8 says you're supposed to be set free from that type of bondage. And they'll tell you, just go ahead and dig yourself deeper. Go ahead and get right on in the hole. And God's blessing you, and he's giving you this, and he's giving you that, and he's doing this, and he's doing that for you. It's not God doing it. It's either yourself or the devil deceiving you into it. It's not God doing all that. And if anything ever happens, people will say, you know, this is what the Lord did, but there's no proof that's what really God did for you, because if you're not in his will, you can't really be assured that he's even doing anything for you. Maybe that was just chance that happened to you. Uh, maybe it was just someone, a bleeding heart soul that gave you whatever it was. I mean, it is a blessing to know that you get things from the Lord and not from some bleeding heart. Amen. But these ministries like to get things from bleeding hearts because they ask you to be a bleeding heart and bleed on them with some finances. Amen. They really do like that. Rather than, you know, standing up like the early church would have and just give them the money back. Are you giving this to me because you feel sorry for me? My father owns everything. You don't need to feel sorry for me. As a matter of fact, you just keep whatever it is you were going to give. I've got plenty myself. No, they would never do that. They want people just to come out with a bleeding heart and just spill out the finances upon them. 
Why? Because they don't know how to trust God for their needs. And a person who doesn't know how to trust God for his needs may prove himself later to be not even a believer. And one of these ministries or any of these big ministries who do not know how to trust God for their finances prove themselves from the very start not to be a biblical ministry because that's one of the qualifications. It's not one of the qualifications on how good you can pull for an offering. And many times that's what's portrayed that that proves you're a good minister. You can pull for an offering. I mean, some people can do it in such a way they just about make you weep and you're not even trying to weep. You don't even like them. But some of them are trained so well and so slick, they'll make you cry there before you even know that you're crying. And they've got that hundred out of your bill full before you know that you gave it. Some people are good at that. That's not a qualification for the ministry. Dear friends, that's a disqualification for the ministry. You're disqualified if you act like a charlatan like that. And that's what most of them do. And they're just able to pull the wool over people's eyes quicker than just about anything. Well, here's another article. Uh, this must have been several years ago before the other one that I just gave. Now, this is about the leader or one of the leaders they call the granddaddy of the faith teachers and his life and his ministry. And, of course, it's uh, from this particular individual as well as others in the same camp that all of the controversy has, generally speaking, centered around. Uh, why? Because people like ourselves don't receive the national attention that these uh, tens of thousands of people that follow groups and ministries like this do. Now, do they really believe what the Bible teaches about faith? Well, here in this article, it goes on to mention the ORU professors and their criticisms that they've had directed against some of these faith teachers, this man in particular. And, of course, one of those criticisms is their uh, disdainment for medical science and <clears throat> leaning to the arm of the flesh. However... They say that although this particular individual believes that God desires for every Christian to be healthy, uh, he does not criticize the use of doctors. And he does not counsel people to throw away their medicine or discard their glasses. Now, they give a quote uh, from their mail out back in 1978. I checked it just to make sure it was right, and I've got this in my files, but I'll read it out of the article here at least part of the account of what he had to say to someone concerning divine healing. Now, listen carefully and find out, is this really what the Bible teaches about faith? It said that a couple were attending some services that uh, we were holding, and the wife of the couple uh, wore glasses. They were about a quarter of an inch thick. After the service, one night uh, we went out to get a bite to eat with them and we were sitting across the table from them she said brother such and such I came up tonight in that healing line that you had you laid hands on me for healing and I pulled off my glasses pulling off your glasses and then it goes on to give part of her account he says pulling off your glasses will not heal you uh, she thought that was an act of faith yet there are other ways to act our faith Jesus said, when you pray, believe. What is it you are to believe? That you have them? No. He said to believe that you receive them. And what shall happen? And then ye shall have them. If this woman had possessed her healing, she would not have needed her glasses. I said to her, Mark 11:24 says to believe you receive. You do not have to believe you have it. It is quite obvious that you do not have it. But you do this the last thing every night before you go to bed, when you take your clothes off, then take your glasses off, lay them down beside the bed and say, I believe I receive my healing. This is all that he asks us to do. Then whenever the healing is manifested, you'll no longer need the glasses. So he says Mark 11:24 does not say that you are to believe that you have it whenever you pray. But it says believe that you receive it and then you shall have it. Now, obviously, Mark 11:24 has two tenses. Believe that you receive it 
And in the English, all that means is received because it's going to be past tense from and you shall have it. And he says, you don't have to believe that you have it because obviously you don't. So then what's he saying? I mean, where's faith then? Faith is totally absent here. He says, you don't have it. You prayed to get it, but he said, you don't have it. Well, then faith is not present. And that's what he himself is saying. Now, this particular one of the teachers is the one who boasts on the fact he's taught 200 messages from Mark 11:24, And he doesn't even know what Mark 11:24 says in the English, let alone by the Spirit or anything else or any deeper implication. He doesn't even know his tenses that Believe that you receive them is past tense to and you shall have them. You've got a past tense. It's present the moment that you pray. Believe that you receive when you pray. That's what we always teach. When you pray, believe that you receive. But guess what? One second past that time, then you have to believe that you have received because it's past tense now. For the continuation of this message,